Let's do it more geometrically. Uh, there's a nice uh, geometric interpretation to this thing. So it comes from uh, thinking of this in phase space, phase space. So this is motion in the xp plane. So let's think of the motion of this oscillator in the xp plane. Here we have that the energy is equal to p squared over 2m plus 1 half m omega squared x squared. So this is an ellipse in the x, uh, a closed orbit, um, a constant omega solution is an ellipse in this plane. Um, that's because it's a sum of something squared plus something squared with different coefficients. So here it is, it's some sort of ellipse like that. Semi-major axis, semi-minor axis, I actually don't know which is the major and which is the minor, but two semi-axis. Well, uh, when p is equal to zero, what is the value of x defines uh, this. So um, a is the value of x when um, p is zero. So it's two um, square root of two e over m omega squared, and b is the value of p when x is equal to 0, so it's just square root of 2me. And here is the particle doing this uh, motion in this uh, orbit. As time goes by, the position x goes from a maximum to a minimum and return with the momentum going like that. It's a, a nice representation of the physical motion as moving on the ellipse. That's what the system is doing. So um, you could ask, uh, when you have something like that, you would ask, OK, you have an ellipse. What's the area of the ellipse? Area is pi AB, that's the formula for the area of an ellipse, pi times the product of the semi and major and semi minor axis that clearly generalizes correctly to a circle and it's the right formula. And then when we multiply it, look what happens. Uh, there is a, do I have, uh, yeah, I think I have everything here. Pi b, I get 2 pi, the m's cancel, the e's all cancel, e over omega. Hey, that's our adiabatic invariant. 2 pi e over omega, the area of this thing, is our adiabatic invariant. That's a very nice classical picture. You have motion in phase space, and as omega changes, maybe the ellipse will change, but the area tends to keep constant. That's what's happening. That's the statement of this result. So that's nice. Uh, uh, it also can be written as a, as a formula, which is uh, kind of neat. So the area of the ellipse is this, but the area of the ellipse, area of the ellipse, it can also be written in a slightly different way. Uh, let's assume the orbit is going like this, for example. The motion is going like that.
And then, what is the area of the lips? We, the area of this top part is the integral of p dx. Is the integral of the top part. But we'll write it, uh, that's just the top. But if I think of this as an integral over the whole counter, I would be having the whole integral of p dx, like that, integral over the whole counter. I integrate here, and I get the area of the top. And when I integrate down here, I'm having dx's that are negative and p's that are negative. So I'm getting the area of the bottom part. So Actually, this full counter integral over the whole boundary gives you the full area of the thing. The top area in one part, the bottom area in the bottom part. So that's the area of the ellipse. So we get uh, the idea that the integral of p dx is roughly equal to 2 pi e over omega. That's exactly equal when the system is uh, time independent. But then, if it's not time independent, this is an equation that can help us uh, think of this uh, system and identify an adiabatic invariant. Because we identify this quantity as an adiabatic invariant. The more general statement in classical mechanics is that this kind of integral is an adiabatic invariant. Invariant. So in classical mechanics, people search from adiabatic invariants by integrals over phase space. It's a nice way to think of them. But let's go quantum mechanical. Uh, it's the analogies that we mentioned before, let's use them. So here we go. We've said a little about this, and we'll say a bit more. So for quantum mechanics, what do we have? Um, well, we had the oscillator. We mentioned it. And we said that E over omega was h bar omega occupation number plus 1 half over omega. And it's therefore h n plus 1 half. So, in quantum mechanics, the adiabatic invariant becomes a quantum number. And uh, the adiabatic theorem in quantum mechanics is essentially going to say that if you have quantum numbers, you are almost guaranteed, if the system is slowly varying, to remain in that quantum state. We're going to try to make that uh, clearer, but. Uh, that's the spirit. You, quantum numbers don't change under adiabatic approximation. Quantum numbers don't change. So in some sense, this whole story we've developed today, uh, the classical intuition, maybe it's a little less obvious, is integrals over phase space, a trajectory in phase space of a particle conserves the area. And here, in quantum mechanics, is the idea that if you have a quantum number, you're going to find it difficult to have a change in quantum numbers. But that's all we've been doing with uh, time-dependent perturbation theory, change of quantum numbers. So we'll, we'll think a little bit about it, why that happened. Now, there's more here that is uh, interesting. You remember your WKB approximation. 
you did the quantization when you had a system, say, with two turning points, A and B. Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization. Remember, you assume there's a decaying thing here, therefore a cosine in the middle with a pi over 4, a decaying theorem, another cosine with a pi over 4, and the compatibility gave you the quantization condition. Now, uh, what was that quantization condition? It was 1 over h bar integral of the local momentum, dx, a over b, equals n plus 1 half pi. So if you multiply by 2 this integral, that is the full integral over the back and forth of p of x dx is equal to 2 uh, pi h bar n plus 1 half. That formula, if you remember, gave the oscillator exactly. But look uh, how nice you see the intuition that this quantity of classical mechanics that we said is the adiabatic invariant also shows in semi-classical quantization, telling you that that quantity, yes, doesn't want to change because, in fact, it represents a quantum number. So the WKB approximation is also reinforcing the idea that, first, this quantity, this integral over phase space is an adiabatic invariant, and second, that it represents a quantum number that doesn't want to change. Um, let me make uh, one last comment before we start a, a real calculation in quantum mechanics about this. Um, transitions. Um, we study transitions, and transitions are the kind of things that don't happen easily when you have an adiabatic approximation. So what did we have for transitions? For transitions, we had the probability to go from some initial to some final state was the integral from 0 to t e to the i omega f i t prime delta h of t prime f i over i h bar d t prime. Assume you have a constant perturbation. Perturbation. So you can take this quantity out of the integral, delta h f i of t prime squared over h squared, and you get this integral of uh, e to the i omega f i t prime. And that integral can roughly be done. And it's, you've done it a few times. f i t minus 1 over omega f i squared. So this is what we got for a constant perturbation. And a constant perturbation finds it hard to induce energy jumping transition. So if you have a discrete system, making a transition is hard because however time you let go, this quantity is, uh, maybe there's a square here. Yes, there's a square. This quantity is bounded in time. This doesn't grow beyond the particular quantity. But here you have a suppression because the energies are different. And if the energies are fairly different, this is very suppressed. The way this, uh, our calculations escaped that was saying, oh, if you have a continuum behind these discrete states, then you can make a transition because you don't have to have um, 
a large change of energy. So our transitions are things that illustrate a little bit what we're getting to, that it's difficult to change energy levels for slowly varying processes. In fact, if this Hamiltonian was not exactly a time constant, it's still difficult to make a transition because you know, if it varies slowly, this is still roughly true. Um, over some period of time, you could say, well, it's the average value. In order to get an efficient transition between two energy levels, you had to put a Hamiltonian that had a, a cosine of omega t at the right frequency, and then you induce the transition. But a slowly varying Hamiltonian finds it difficult to induce transitions. All right. Uh, so uh, this is our end of our introduction to the subject uh, of adiabatic uh, evolution. And now we're going to try to calculate uh, how a quantum state changes under adiabatic evolution.